seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go! Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you all could be here. Um, hope you all had a good breakfast. Now it's time to work that off. Let's stand up to our feet and let's just get into some worship and praise. and welcome to Just Church. I'm Pastor John. Pastor Rachel's going to be bringing the message in a little bit. Pastor James is going to pray for us and is with our kids today. Pastor Kevin's making all the magic happen back in the tech booth. I will say, if you are interested in helping us out with tech, write that on the connection card that Kevin will talk about later. But announcements. As you know, we have two services every Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. In between, we do breakfast over at the community center before i'll tell you it's awesome they did maple bacon pancakes today they're just they're unreal <laughs> unreal uh we have a honduras mission trip coming up in june and so if you are interested another thing for your connection card write honduras on there and also see pastor rachel after service today she wants to chat with you 
if you're interested. And even a little bit of interest, she wants to talk to you. All right, men's conference is coming up. We have a Warriors conference. That's May 16th through the uh, 18th. And so, again, you can put that on your connection card. If you're interested in coming, the total price is $265. Includes the conference, T-shirt, swag, uh, lodging and all that fun stuff, uh, tons of activities. It's a it's a great time. We James and I usually cook for everybody. We do breakfast and dinner together as a as a church, and then we uh, enjoy the service services they put on and just the connections. Beautiful. So men, come out for that, or let us know if you're interested. See James or I. Uh, Celebrate Recovery happens every Tuesday night. Best place to be on a Tuesday evening. Above A1 Deli, 5.45 for the meals, 6.30 for large group, and small groups at 7.30. And the last thing is just students. If you're interested in a youth group or, or uh, supporting the youth group, um, see Jen Mackinich right over there, Jen. Yep. And it's a great time Thursday evening, 6 to 8. Weather's starting to get better, so they'll be doing more and more outside. And, uh, what, well, gaga ball, volleyball, all that good stuff. All right, that's enough business. Let us pray and get back into worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we're going to be talking about today and how it indwells us forever and ever and gives us your power, your spirit to do the work in this world. Gives us gifts, gives us connection so that we are brothers and sisters here, just like it'll be in heaven. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who brought it all together, did the work of redemption and salvation, and you resurrected him, and we celebrated that last Sunday. Amen? Amen. So let us just uh, uh, experience today Pentecost. Even though it's not coming yet, we're going to share, we're going to know about that Holy Spirit, and we're going to see the magic that happens when God indwells man. So we just praise you, Lord, and we thank you for all of this and more in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let us rise and worship the Lord our God. Oh, 
just know where we are when we have the opportunity to be in your presence allow us to just take advantage of that to sit there and to soak in your presence lord god is amazing to just know that you are here for us that we can be fully secure in you lord we are so grateful so thankful that you chose us, that we could worship you, that you died for our sins, that way we can spend the rest of our life with you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. So now, hi guys, how are you? I'm Pastor James. I walked into the prayer. I, I don't know what happened there. Normally I introduce myself, but it was spirit-led for sure. Now I have the opportunity to bring up Pastor Kevin. He's going to be talking about the connection cards and all that fun stuff. Here you go. Let's give it up. Thanks, Pastor James. Pastor yeah. Kevin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. And I'm here to just uh, alert you to the, uh, the presence of this connection card. You can find, it in the, find one on the back of your seat. Um, these are really important uh, because, number one, you can give us your information. Uh, we won't spam you just so we can stay in touch with you. I think we do two emails a week. Um, it's, it's not overwhelming or anything, just so you know what's going on. Uh, and then you have the opportunity to communicate with us as well. Um, so there's your personal information. And if you haven't updated it in a while, I, I'd like to say this, you know, consider doing so, so that we have records 
uh, properly assigned to the right people when we do our offering envelopes and things like that. I mean, offering statements and stuff like that. Um, also on the back, along with my notes, you see some little check boxes where you can indicate where uh, or if you might like to be part of our helps ministry. Uh, we require a lot of help, even in a church that, you know, we're not a mega church. I'm not sure that we want to be a mega church. Um, but in any church, there's a lot of help that's necessary to make services go well and for things to present well. So you can check off things like that. Uh, Pastor John mentioned three things. Uh, the Honduras trip, if you have any interest in that, note that on your connection card, and we'll be looking for it. Uh, the Men's Warriors Conference. Um, what did James leave? What were the dates of those? The 16th to the 18th. To the 18th. Um, if you're of May, thank you. If you are interested in that, you can make note on the back, and we'll get you more information. Uh, you can talk to Pastor James or any of the leadership here, and give you more information. <laughs> Lastly, tech help. If you uh, notice slides out of order or blank screen, or you know uh, something not going right. In service, it's probably because I or whoever, uh, and today Pastor John back there gets distracted trying to do too many things. So if you have any technical acumen, or even if you don't, uh, Chris was offering, he said, I'd, I'd like to help, but I, I don't know what I'm doing. I say, watch this. And he's sitting and watch the slides. He's like, uh, press the button, press the button so the words come up. It's a little bit more to, than the, <laughs> than, to it than that, uh, but you can do it. So if you have any, any interest in helping, you're not going to be locked in the back room forever or anything. Um, the more people that we have, the more we can cycle through and give everybody a chance to be part of service as well. So feel free to reach out to myself or Pastor John uh, or anybody on the tech team. Uh, which today is myself or Pastor John, and uh, we'll give you some more info and, and uh, clue you in to, as to what uh, you might want to or be able to do. All right, and the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just pray over our offering. Um, it's funny, I was just thinking about this. I don't know why I got off on this thought, but notice that we say this is an offering instead of a taking. Somebody stood up and said, okay, good morning, church. It's time for uh, us to take your money. You know, it has a whole different vibe and feel, doesn't it? It's because, it's, uh, unfortunately, I think some churches kind of have that attitude. I've, I've been to that church. Um, we don't, I remember one time, I'm taking too long because we have communion. But I'm going to say it anyway. One time, this preacher stood up and said, everybody, take out your wallet. And he was serious. Now, take $20 out of your wallet if you have it. Or take 5 if you don't. So everybody did. said, okay, the offering basket's going to come around. Put your wallet in it. <laughs> He was half kidding, right? Uh, but anyway, we don't do that here. If you're visiting with us uh, this morning, we want you to realize that you're exempt from our offering. We're not putting pressure on uh, anybody, especially visitors, that you know you have to pay a cover charge to come to church here. Um, but it's an offering. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 11:24, it says, "One person gives freely, yet gains even more." Another withholds unduly and comes to poverty. So it's a backwards kingdom we live in. So many things are backwards when we walk with God. One of them is the more you give, the more you get, or the more you can experience abundance. The less you give, the more likely you are not to experience God's abundance. Okay, and that's not just money. That's everything, right? So be a giver. So, Father, as we come before you today, as we offer our hearts and our minds to you, as we uh, offer our finances, as we offer our time, as we offer... Uh, all that you are calling us to give, that we might be part of this movement that you are uh, just using to revolutionize the world. God, we pray that you would use our gifts, that many people would be, be, would be reached, uh, that eyes would be opened, that ears would be opened, that hearts would be um, saved, that joy would replace pain and hopelessness. We just thank you, God, for using us to accomplish these things through and by the power and the Holy Spirit that you've given to us through Jesus, our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray today. Amen. 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 Seeing wonderful, lovely, uh, spiritually connected Pastor Rachel Howard. <laughs> yeah. It's quite the buildup right there, huh? You can tell there's, there's a light... I know, light, light tech team, I don't have my music. That's okay, that's okay. Jason was singing it for me, so that's good. This is how we do it. If you're visiting with us for the first time. <laughs> yeah, you like that? I usually have, oh, there we go, see? I'm a big baseball fan. Dallas have their own walk-up music. This is my walk-up music, so. Just get us all a little bit hyped, right, okay? Good morning, good morning. <laughs> Jill 
loves that. I am Pastor Rachel, the worship and teaching pastor here at this church. If I haven't had a chance to say hello to you, hopefully I'll get to do that after service, but I'm very, very um, excited that you're here with us. And every time we kind of move into a new um, sermon series, I, I'm always saying this is going to be the best sermon series ever. I'm so excited. Uh, but I really mean it today. Because um, we're actually going back to a sermon series that we had started at the beginning of the year. Now, don't worry if you weren't here, because uh, I'm going to bring you up to speed a little bit. And actually, all the messages are online if you want to go back and watch any of them. But we started at the beginning of the year a series that I'm really loving, and it's called The Bible Book a Week. And so what we do, just to kind of gain a little bit of biblical literacy, is we talk about a book of the Bible every single week and just kind of give a nice overview. And we're doing it in little chunks so that we're not just going to go through the whole thing all at once. We started with the Gospels. And so we did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are the first four books in the New Testament. And they talk about the life and ministry of Jesus. So those are the ones that we did at the beginning of the year. As I said, they're all online. You can go to Facebook and go to YouTube if you miss them. And I'd encourage you to go back and watch them. Um, because they do kind of, everything kind of builds on one another as we keep going through. So today, we're moving beyond the Gospels and into the next book, which is the book of Acts, which if you know anything about the book of Acts, it's a wild, wild ride, and I'm so excited. It's one of my favorite books. So chronologically, it does pick up right after the Gospels, and so Jesus has been arrested, beaten, crucified, and has risen again. And this is great timing, right, because we're coming off of Easter, so we've just experienced that. We've just walked through Holy Week. And so now we're going to look at the very beginning of Acts here. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. So we know a couple things from this verse right here. We know, number one, that the author of Acts wrote another book. We also know that he's writing to someone named Theophilus. So if you were with us before, you might kind of, hear this rattling around in your brain. It might sound a little bit familiar. And we don't have to go back too far. We go back to the book of Luke. And the book of Luke starts off in chapter 1, right in the beginning, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you might know the certainty of things that you have been taught. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we understand that Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. Now, we talked a little bit about this reference to Theophilus when we were going through the book of Luke, and I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to give us a little bit of context because it's important. Um, who is Theophilus? Here's the short answer. We don't know. All right? I know that's not very satisfying, but I'll tell you what we do know. We know how he's introduced in the book of Luke, and that is the most honorable Theophilus. So we know that this is someone most likely of some prominence, perhaps a, a dignitary or something like that, high-ranking official. And then it goes on to say, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have heard. So we also know that at some point, this Theophilus heard the gospel of Jesus and he believed. And so Luke is writing these writings to, to solidify what it is that he's already heard and believed. And so again, we're not really sure who he is, and we're not really sure why Luke is writing to him in particular, but we have a pretty good theory here. And that is that at this time, producing a written work was extremely expensive. Paper was expensive, it was expensive to have someone scribe everything out, it, it was very expensive. So what would generally happen is authors would go and they would find a benefactor or a donor who would back whatever it is they're looking to write. And in exchange, it would be dedicated to that person. And so there's a good chance here that Theophilus was someone who backed Luke's writings, who, who paid for and sponsored his writings. And how much do we owe to Theophilus for sowing into God's kingdom, for doing that? Because if he didn't, we might not have these books. That's pretty amazing to think about right there. So beginning of Acts, as I said, Luke once again dedicates his writings to Theophilus, and then he picks up right where he left off in his gospel. 
Again, we said in, in verse 1 in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then Luke goes on to do a little recap of kind of what happened at the end of his book. And for those of you who are old enough, like we used to actually watch TV and you couldn't just watch whatever you want all the time. You'd have to like actually watch what was on TV. And so at the beginning of the next episode, it'd be like, and now a recap of what happened last time in the book of Luke. And that's kind of what Luke does here. So, so we see the book of Luke. And at the end, we have chapter 24, starting in verse 49. It says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit. And this is Jesus talking. Just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Then Jesus led them, the disciples, to Bethany. And lifting up his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. And so that's the end of Luke right there. And so then we flip to the beginning of Acts, chapter 1. And right there, Luke writes, During the 40 days after he, again, this is Jesus, suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift you promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we have kind of this similar account of events, this overlapping in the la end of the book of Luke of the book of Acts. But then in Acts, we get a little bit more detail here. See, we, we see the disciples, and after Luke writes, that, writes this, after Jesus said, in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, the disciples kind of go back to their old ways, right? Jesus has just promised them the Holy Spirit, and here's what it says. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? So this is so interesting because these, these, these people just walked through the end of Jesus' ministry. They walked through his betrayal, his arrest. Remember Peter came, he cut off the soldier's ear with the sword, and Jesus is like, hey, wait a minute, cut, cut that out. That's not what we're here for, right? They saw him beaten, crucified, and yet these guys are still like, hey, is it time to drop the hammer now? Like, is that what we're doing now? And Jesus is like, no, no, that's not what we're doing at all. And so he says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see them. See him. So again, that kind of rounds out what we saw at the end of Luke. We see this at the beginning of Acts here. We see the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we see Jesus' ascension back to heaven. And then as we move through chapter 1 of Acts, we start to see some really interesting things happen, right? We see all of the disciples gathered together in this upstairs room where they're staying, and Peter gets up and he takes charge, as Peter often does. And he says, hey, listen, we lost Judas, right? Judas is clearly out. So we need to do something. We need, we need to bring someone else in to round out the 12. And so he quotes from Psalm 69 and 109. And in Psalm 69, 25, he says this, May his place be deserted. Now, we should have stopped there. But he said, May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And then in Psalm 109, 8, it says, May another take his place of leadership. And so here's what the disciples do. They nominate two men. And then they pray for God's will as to which one of them should join. And then they do what they call cast lots. I just want to stop for a second and I want to say, you hear that? That is the sound of life in a church. And so we love that sound. We love to hear kids playing and crying and doing all kids stuff because that is the sound of a church that is alive. Okay? I just want to say that. Woo! So, <laughs> whoop, whoop. yay, noisy kids, we love them, so. <laughs> All right, so, so th this is what they do. They pray for God's will as to who should join them. They got these two guys that they've nominated, and then they cast these lots, right? Now, it doesn't really say what that looks like, but you know what casting lots essentially is? 
Well, let me give you a little picture. So you're praying on God's will, right? You're like, I don't know, I got a new job or some big life event. You're like, God, I don't know which way to go. Help me, help me discern. And you pray to him and you say, you know, show me your will, guide me, amen. And then you go out to your car and you drive to Encore, right? And you, you play like blackjack or something. And you're like, if I hit here, then I'm doing this. That's essentially what they did here, okay? Casting lots is essentially some sort of gambling. It's, it's cho choosing cards, it's choosing straws, whatever it might have been. But this is what they did. So there's two lessons here we can learn from this. Number one, no matter how bad you think you have messed up in your life, remember the disciples doing this right here, okay? <laughs> Jesus has just left them, and Peter's like, all right, here's what we got to take care of. Who's got the dice? Like, let's figure this out, all right? So no matter where you are, no matter how much you've messed up, this is what was happening in the book of Acts right now. And the second thing we can learn from this is don't try to take into your own control that which rightfully belongs to God. And I think that's a lesson that we all probably need to learn at one time or another. You know who um, wins this casting of lots? Who's selected to replace Judas? Matthias. You know Matthias, that guy who did so much in the New Testament that we hear about all the time? If you've read the New Testament, you know that's not true. <laughs> and actually, if you don't, just Google him, right? Just Google him, and here's the first thing that comes up. Matthias received the Holy Spirit with the other apostles. He is not mentioned again in the New Testament. And here's another website. This is actually an entire website dedicated to St. Matthias. And it says, St. Matthias was present with the other apostles at Pentecost. Aside from this, little is known of the rest of Matthias' life. According to one tradition, he preached for a time in Jerusalem, and eventually he was stoned and beheaded. That's it. That's what we hear about Matthias, okay? So again, don't try to take into control that which rightfully belongs to God. Jesus chose the original 12, and he's going to take care of choosing another through his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, there is another who God raises up in the book of Acts, arguably the most prominent person in the New Testament after Jesus, but you're going to have to wait on that because we're not going to talk about that right now. Oh, I know, it's a cliffhanger, huh? So we're going to move into Acts chapter 2 now. I know, we're only in chapter 2. Can you believe it? There's just a, so much going on here. And chapter 2 is one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. And the action really starts right away. Anybody who tells you the Bible is boring has never read it, or, or they've at least never read it with the right mindset, because, man. So verse 1, right away it says, on the day of Pentecost. If you don't know anything about Pentecost, we're going to hear something about it right now. Acts 2, 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native language. So there's a lot here, right? This can be a little bit overwhelming if you're, if you're a new believer or if you're not used to reading this, if you're not, not used to hearing about Pentecost. There's these tongues of fire coming down on the disciples. They're speaking in other languages. There's a lot going on here. And if that's not bad enough, if you continue along in Acts, I'm not going to read it, but um, some people in the crowd are like, these guys are drunk, and so they have to unpack that too. But let's just talk about what we just read here. Pentecost was a fulfillment of a promise made by Jesus many times. And we've already seen that, right, in Luke and at the beginning here of the book of Acts. And I want to go back to the book of John, where it's another account by John <clears throat> of Jesus making this promise. So it's John chapter 4, verse 16. And Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. 
He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So Jesus is essentially saying to them, listen, my earthly ministry is done here. I've got to go. I've got to go back where I came from. Right? Remember, he ascends back to heaven. But there's another. God's going to send another who will never leave you. Because he's with you right now and he's going to be in you. So there's the promise. And, and that word that in this version is, is translated as advocate is a Greek word, parakletos. And in Greek, it literally meant one who goes before a judge and argues your cause for you. And there's other versions of the Bible that use different words, intercessor, comforter, counselor. But the point is this. Just like Jesus was the perfect sacrifice to reconcile us to the Father. Remember, we talked about this. Our sins separated us from God. We have a perfect God who cannot stand in the presence of sin. So our sin separates us from God. But Jesus died on the cross to pay that price for you and for me. And so his sacrifice reconciled us to the Father. But then the Holy Spirit comes to carry on that role. The Holy Spirit comes to comfort us, to advocate for us, to intercede for us, to plead our case before the Father. And the Holy Spirit rounds out this three persons of God that we believe in, referred to the whole, as the Holy Trinity. And, and I just want to be very clear that we are a monotheistic faith, right? We believe in one God, one true God, Yahweh. But he's one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if you've been with us before, you know that's how I finish every single service. And if you haven't been with us before... You're going to hear it in just a couple minutes. Now, I do just want to say, the Trinity, it's a mystery. Like, I, I don't believe I'm ever going to understand fully this side of heaven. But you can bet when I cross over, it's going to be one of the first questions I ask God. <laughs> but just trust me. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. They are all part and parcel to God. They are all persons of God here for us. And the Holy Spirit is God with us and in us at all times. So just a couple more things I want to highlight about Pentecost. One of the remarkable things about Pentecost is this picture we see of these disciples able to speak in all of these languages, the people able to hear them in all of these different languages, every single person present there. And there's a lot of different people there, all Jews, but a lot of different people from a lot of different places there because it was actually a Jewish festival um, that I'm not going to try to pronounce, but if you want to know, Pam and Jill will tell you what, it, what the pronunciation is. But it's the celebration of the giving of the Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai. And so all of the Jews had come to Jerusalem. So there's a large presence of people who aren't usually necessarily in Jerusalem there at that time. And so there's a wide diversity of languages being spoken by those who are present there in that day. And each one of them hears the gospel in their own language. And I love this picture because it is symbolic, right? It gives this picture of the inclusivity of God's kingdom, where people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, are invited into the blessings of salvation through Jesus. And we see this come to pass in John's revelation Jesus. The very last book of the New Testament, Revelation, chapter 7, starting in verse 9, says this. And this is John writing, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What an amazing picture that is. And think about that. They've got those palm branches, right? You remember the last time we had those palm branches? It's when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, coming in for his arrest, his crucifixion. And so we, hear, we see here kind of a full circle moment. They've got those palm branches. 
but it's every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, um, all together. And that's what God's kingdom looks like. Now, some of you might have heard this story before, but when John and I were at the very beginning of our ministry, we had, we had literally just gotten our pastoral call. We had just declared our intention to become pastors in the United Methodist Church. Um, we had gone to our very first pastor's conference, and we were on our way home, so we were all hyped up. It was, you know, we'd had all the, the great, you know, pouring into, and we were super excited. So we're in the airport uh, on our layover in Chicago, and we're you know, working on like a dream board type of a thing. What, are, what is our ministry going to look like? We were terrible parents, so we hadn't gotten any gifts for our kids. And our kids were pretty little at that time, so we had to bring something home. So we're like, all right, let's go. Whatever stores there are here in the airport, we got to find something, right? So we went in, and there was, a, um, there was a house of blues there, like a little itty-bitty one. And we're like, all right, maybe we can find something cool here. And um, as we had been doing our dream boards, these were verses that we had been focused on. And we had write, written down one phrase that we knew was central to our ministry. And that phrase was unity and diversity. We knew that was what our ministry needed to look like. People from every nation, every color, every socioeconomic background, no matter what your, your faith background had been, that's what it needed to look like. And we went into the House of Blues, of course, looking for stuff for our kids. Everything was way too expensive. But... Um, Sitting on the counter was this little bin of buttons. And among those buttons were these little buttons that said unity and diversity. And man, God was so, and you get some of those God shots sometimes, and you're just like, man, that's, he, he's at work. He's, he's moving. And we knew that that wasn't just like our own craziness, like, hey, here's what we're going to do. Like, he was really speaking into us. That's what we're going to do. And I still have some of those purple buttons. I think Alexis has one, I'm pretty sure. There's one on one of my jackets. And to me, this is just like, these are, this, is, this is it. This, this is what we're doing. This is the kingdom right here. Now, a little bit more uh, about Pentecost. Sometimes we, we have this thought that Pentecost is a one-time event, right? We, we celebrate it, and we will celebrate it when we get there. It's uh, 50 days after Easter. 50, right? I always get that wrong. Penta, penta means 50, right? Okay. So it's 50 days after Easter, so we commemorate Pentecost on that day. So we tend to kind of think of it as, hey, this, this is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, right? And it is. You know, Spirit poured out on disciples, check. We got that one. But the outpouring on the disciples ignites this fire. And that fire enables the gospel and the good news of Jesus to spread across all nations. Right? Remember what we talked about earlier, that it was going to, it was going to, Jesus promised that. It's going to go to all the ends of the earth. It's Samaria and blah, 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 everywhere. It's going to go everywhere. And not only to those nations, but to generations. And it sparks the beginning of the early church. Empowering the presence of the Holy Spirit. Allowing the disciples, ordinary men and women, right, who had made a lot of mistakes along the way. But it allowed them to be transformed into these bold witnesses for Jesus through the power and the presence of God's Spirit. But it wasn't just this one-time event, right? I want you to hear this today, if you don't already know this. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit happens every single day. It happens on you, and it happens on me. At least I hope it happens on you. And if it hasn't, I just want you to know that it can. Anybody can have the presence of the Holy Spirit if we just come before God, if we just humble ourselves, if we just recognize that we need a Savior, that we accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. If we can come to that place, we come before our Father, and he will put his spirit in us. And, and I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. Because I'm going to foreshadow a little bit of the future. I will echo the Apostle Paul. Of all the sinners, I'm the worst. And so if it can happen to someone like me, it can happen to you. God's just waiting to pour his spirit into you if you want that. And I want that for you. You just have to ask. 
So the Holy Spirit is not just for a certain point of time. It's not just for a single group in time. And in fact, it's not even just personal. Pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was the catalyst for the mission of the early church. So by each one of us receiving the Holy Spirit, we have the same mission as the early church together here as a church family. And the early church is such an awesome picture. Some of my favorite verses are here at the end of chapter 2 when it talks about all the believers being together. But here's the thing. I know I'm calling this series Bible Book a Week, but there's just too much more here. So we are not going to cover Acts in one week. In fact, we're not going to cover Acts in two weeks. We're going to cover Acts in three weeks. So if you want to hear about the early church, you're going to have to come back, okay? Is that, is that a deal? Everybody's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> you're going to have to come back, okay? Yeah. All right, all right. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for the presence of your spirit here today. I just want to pray over anybody who just feels they've never experienced the spirit or just isn't sure, God. I just pray for our hearts to be fully turned towards you, for that to be the greatest of our desires, to fully experience your spirit with and in us, right here now in this place, and that we would just lay down our hearts and just ask for you to just allow the spirit to indwell us, allow your spirit to work in and through us, individually and at, here as a church family, so that we may boldly declare your name, boldly share the gospel with all of those that we come in contact with. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of building your kingdom here on earth. I just ask that you would embolden each one of us in a way that we can carry out that mission. We thank you and praise you. And we offer all of this up in your mighty, mighty name. Amen and amen. Um, it is the first week of the month, so first Sunday of the month, and you're all wearing name tags. So if you don't know what that means, that means we are going to do communion um, today. And so just a little bit about how we do communion here um, at Just Church. Um, we have what we call an open communion table. And so that means that you do not have to be a member or do not have ever had to have walked in the doors of this or any other church ever before. You just need to be one who has a desire to have a deeper relationship with Jesus and to come before the Lord's table. Um, we do communion by what is called intinction. And so that means that as you come forward, I'm going to offer you the bread, the body of Christ. John's going to offer you, offer you the cup, the blood of Christ. And we would welcome you to take that bread, dip it into the cup, and take the elements together as a sign of the unity of the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Now I will say, depending on your faith background, please do not grab the cup and try to drink out of it because if you do, Jason will try to tackle you so that we still have, have the cup for everybody. Um, the cup, just so you know, it is, it is juice. We don't want anybody to be um, kept away from the Lord's table. Um, we're going to prepare for a minute, and then um, as the Spirit leads, you can come forward. I would um, recommend that we come up through here and then go back down through the end. If the Spirit moves you otherwise, feel free, but you might get in other people's way. So we're going to prepare. Also, the bread is gluten-free, just to let you know. Woo. gather here today and we are reminded of a day very much like this when Jesus gathered together 
with his disciples in the upper room. As they were eating, he took the bread. He gave thanks and praise to his Father in heaven. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat from it. In the same way, when the disciples were done eating, he took the cup. Once again, he gave thanks and praise to his Father in heaven. He then took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it and do so in remembrance of me. As the Spirit leads.
to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to live in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to live in your presence. So let the spirit rise up, break through the walls, beat down the doors, and crash through the windows. Cover the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. Let the spirit rise up, break the walls, beat down the doors, and crash through the windows. Cover the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. Cover the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. It is a privilege and an honor to worship with every single one of you. Love you all so much.